You're also talking about 20, 10, 20% tariffs on the rest of the world. That is going to have a serious effect on the overall economy. And yes, you're going to find some people who will gain from individual tariffs. The overall effect could be massive in I terms agree. of the economy. I agree it's going to have a massive effect, positive effect. Yesterday, Donald Trump walked over to the, uh, what was it, the Economic Club of Chicago. It's one of the oldest, you know, smart guy, patches on the elbows, three-piece suits from Brooke Brothers, uh, the seminars where they get together and try to control our economy and our lives. Presidents often go there. It's hosted by Bloomberg. And Donald Trump sat down for an entire hour to spar with a man who thinks that Donald Trump's economic policies are all bunk. They're terrible. He doesn't like them at all. And did Trump shrink away? Did he say, oh, no, 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 no. I, he sat there without notes, without a script, without a teleprompter. He went toe to toe and he slaughtered him. Watch a little bit. You're also talking about 20, 10, 20% tariffs on the rest of the world. That is going to have a serious effect on the overall economy. And yes, you're going to find some people who will gain from individual tariffs. The overall effect could be massive. I, in terms agree, of the I agree it's going to have a massive effect, positive effect. It's going to be a positive, not a negative. Well, we'll just, just let, let me just tell, no, no, let me tell you. I know how ball. committed you are to this. And it must be hard for you to you know, spend 25 years talking about tariffs as being Listen. negative and then have somebody <laughs> explain to you that you're totally wrong. It'll have a negative, it will have. Let, I'll go 40, a step further. 40 if million, you don't 40 do million, this, President this Trump, 40, million, no 40 million jobs is a lot of jobs to rely on. They're all coming back. No, there's You've 40 lost. million jobs. Those are 40 million jobs in America that rely on trade. Are you ready? John Deere, great company. They announced about a year ago they're going to build big plants outside of the United States, right? They're going to build them in Mexico. And you threatened they're them also going to build them. they stopped. That's right. I said, if John Deere builds those plants and not selling anything into the United States, they just announced yesterday they're probably not going to build the plants, okay? I kept the jobs here. He kept the jobs here without even winning the election. Think about that. And 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 Joe, I hate tariffs from Bloomberg here. He admitted it. Did you catch that? Watch. He actually jumps in and said, yeah, you threatened tariffs and they changed their plans. Watch. Them in Mexico. And you threatened them They're with also tariffs and they stole. That's right. I... You threatened them with that. He just admitted that the threat of tariffs made John Deere change their plans and keep the factories and keep the jobs here. Listen, I understand Republicans of my generation who grew up as children during the Reagan years and Jack Kemp and Milton Friedman and free trade and the rising tide lifts all ships. And I get all that. And in a perfect world, we don't want tariffs. We want everything to be made without any tariffs or taxes layered onto each process or each item that you put onto the automobile at every step of the way you want goods to be able to to traffic across the oceans on ships or on planes and people to be able to buy them without any governments laying on their tariffs and taxes. That's a perfect world. I think we've lived long enough over the last several decades that we don't live in that perfect world. And as committed as America is to free trade and removing tariffs and taxes and layers of government costs on all of those things, our adversaries overseas do not live in that world. And so we're not playing in a balanced way. And the only way to rebalance these things is to threaten that we're no longer going to give every other company and every other country a free ride. We're going to get more into this in a moment and drive down the details of this idea of utilizing tariffs as an economic international bargaining chip. And yes, if necessary, a weapon. But more of Donald Trump squaring off here toe to toe with this guy again for an entire hour unscripted. He's got a script. The questioner has a clipboard there. He's got his questions written down. Trump's just sitting there with his hands on his knees and his red tie dangling. And he did just fine. What is the Wall Street Journal now? I'm meeting with them tomorrow. What is the Wall Street Journal now? They've been wrong about everything. So have you, by the way. You've been wrong. About you're it. trying to turn this. You're trying to turn this. You've been wrong. About no, you're trying to turn. You're trying to turn this into debate. 
There's a, there are it's business people. There are business you're wrong. People. You've been wrong. You've been wrong all your life on this stuff. It's just a humiliating moment, but it's fun when Trump does that. And by the way, uh, everyone's got a smile on their face, right? I mean, he can utilize his witness abrasiveness as a New Yorker in a way that sort of has an impact. By the way, as I keep saying, he's there without notes, without script, without teleprompter, and he's utilizing what he knows about international trade and policies and taxes and decades working in New York, in the real estate world, in the marketing world, in the branding world, and on Wall Street, he's able to engage in these conversations. One must wonder and contrast, how would Kamala Harris do in this setting, right? Well, you don't have to ask. Here's the answer. This was the address to the audience there at the Economic Club of, of Chicago before they brought out Donald Trump. The first is just for the record and for those people watching on television, the Economic Club of Chicago and Bloomberg both invited Vice President Harris to a similar interview about her economic plans that she has declined so far. Yeah, she first, just she just decided that she wasn't going to show, which is probably smart. I mean, after all, she picked a running bait, mate in Tim Walls, who yesterday openly bragged about the fact that he doesn't know what a venture capitalist does. And he wants to have his hands on the steering wheel of our economy. If the economy is an important issue to you, I hope you're paying attention about the competency of the two people who are looking to take over this country's largest economy on the planet. All right, we turn quickly to CNBC because as this conversation was about to happen in Chicago, uh, the man in charge of Donald Trump's transition team, Howard Lutnick, he is a very successful businessman. He engaged on CNBC about this tariff conversation because I'm not going to lie to you. There's a lot of people, many of whom would normally be allies to a Republican presidency and Republican policies with regard to economic growth in this country, uh, people who have worked in the business world in America and on Wall Street and in banking. They don't like the idea of tariffs. And part of that is because what I just laid out for you, many of us as free traders and, and low taxes and low government and let the businesses flourish, we don't like the idea of the government jumping in and putting tariffs in. But understand, you know, for a long time, America's wealth, the government, I should say, the government's income, government, not government wealth, although the government did make a lot of money, uh, was almost entirely based on tariffs. You know, the income tax that the government now relies on to pay its bills, even though they can't actually stay within a budget, the income tax was just instituted at the beginning of the last century. It's only 100 years old. Before that, how did America pay for its troops? How did it build its war machine and build its weapons? How did it pay its bills? Tariffs. Tariffs. And that was during the industrial explosion of the late 19th century. And, and it seemed to work OK. It wasn't until the institution of the income tax that things started to change. And now, instead of corporations and, and countries who want to do business with America, paying the lion's share of the Treasury to the United States federal government, now it's us. See, they relied on us paying portions of our income to keep all the lights on in those federal buildings in Washington, D.C., before it used to be corporations and foreign countries and corporations in those foreign countries who wanted to do business here. Now, we can debate on what's better or worse, but when you think about it in that perspective, I think I know what side I'm on. So here's Mr. Lutnick on CNBC, where they have a freewheeling discussion about these tariffs. And I just want you to think of one thing as you watch this. First of all, imagine one of Kamala Harris's top advisors being able to do this and even have this conversation, number one. But even more importantly, number two, understand that everybody who objects to tariffs and raise the warning flag about all the jobs lost and um, all the expenses and how much, how much it'll cost, they all assume that everything in our economy and in our um, international trade will stay exactly static the way it is right now. The only change would be adding tariffs on top of everything. That's not at all what will happen. Economies and trade and manufacturing, it's not static. Companies and countries and consumers react in real time to real time events that we experience. And if tariffs or even the threat of tariffs are brought into the equation in these realms of conversation with regard to our trade policy and our manufacturing policy, we don't just accept it, that we actually change and modify and things start to shift because of either the application of tariffs or even the threat, the bargaining chip 
of tariffs. Bear that in mind as you watch this conversation unfold. And of course, it's a bargaining chip. We can sell a Ford or GM in Europe. You go to Europe, you can't sell a Ford or GM. Why? There's 100 percent tariffs. How about in Japan? 100 percent tariffs. So do you think if we said we're going to tariff you the way you tariff us, do you think they're going to allow Mercedes and all these Japanese companies and Porsches and BMWs to all of a sudden have 100 percent tariffs in America? Of course not. They're going to come and negotiate and their tariffs are going to come down. And finally, Ford and General Motors are going to be able to sell in these places. How's that sound? That sound of course they're going to come down. Of course. This is just it negotiating. It absolutely makes sense. If you do it strategically, if it's across the board, it creates a real problem. And the question is whether you believe the president is going to do it strategically or across the board. He keeps saying it across the board. Well, when you're running for office, you make broad statements so people understand you. OK, tariffs are an amazing tool by the president to use. They're an amazing tool, but he understands don't tariff stuff we don't make. Right. If we don't make it and you want to buy it, I don't want to put the price up. there. It's pointless. But use tariffs to build in America. If we want to make it in America, tariff it, or if we're competing with a tariff it. But you got to remember, we need to protect the American worker. Finally, someone's going to protect the American worker. Think, and Donald Trump is here to protect the American worker. you think we make worker. a lot of money in tariffs? Or if they're used as negotiating tactics, look, tariffs will come down there. We're not going to have super high tariffs here either. There's not going to be a big pot of money at the end of the day. I, I, I love that story. So which is it? Do we yeah. make a lot of money on tariffs? Or yeah. we... We bring uh, here. productivity here right. and we drive up our, our workers here. So it's a win win scenario. I like both of them. I think what's going to happen is we'll make a bunch of money mm -hmm. on the tariffs, but mostly this everybody else is going to negotiate with us and we will be more fair. In 1948, right, we came up with something called the Marshall Plan, right? The, the world, uh, Germany. And I, I want to get to this in a minute because this is critically important. And sometimes I like to jump in here on a clip. This is about two and a half minutes long, what we've already watched here or, or the entirety of this clip. And sometimes I like to jump in in the middle to sort of reset because I want everyone to focus on what he's about to say with regard to the Marshall Plan. OK, but I hope you understand what's being discussed here and you see how important it is because, you know, the objections are, well, is it across the border? Or is it just you? Because if he uses these terrorists strategically, then that makes sense. But he keeps saying across the board and and. Uh, Luckin's like, well, obviously it's not going to be across the board. If we don't manufacture something, it's stupid for us to tariff it coming in. There's no reason for that, right? And Trump keeps saying one thing that's very important. If American corporations right now here in this country are concerned about tariffs on their products that they manufacture overseas when they bring them back here in the United States, there's a great way to avoid that. Don't manufacture them overseas. That's simple. You don't want tariffs? Fine. Manufacture here. Manufacture here. Pick a state, whatever state. It can even be a blue state. Build your factory. Manufacture here. Are you saying the American worker can't do it? Of course they can. So are you going to pay more money in tariffs when you import things made overseas, sometimes with hostile countries who use slave labor, where you can't look yourself in the mirror at night? Or... Do you want to pay more in wages and benefits to American workers? And, oh, by the way, help out your fellow citizens by making this country strong, stronger and more employed. It's your choice. And by the way, it's our choice as consumers to reward or punish any company that makes a decision that we don't like. This is an amazing and important, powerful tool here. And I want to reiterate. Yes, I am a free trader. I don't like the idea of governments at all on this planet getting involved in screwing up the true free market ideals that we all embrace. But right now it's lopsided. We're the only country who is actually advancing free trade ideals, unless we enter into a negotiated free trade agreement like we have with Canada and Mexico or in some of the other countries. By the way, one other thing that needs to be pointed out, in just four years, the Trump administration negotiated three major trade deals, including renegotiating the NAFTA deal. It's now called the USMC agreement not for the Marine Corps, it's US, Mexico, Canada. Uh, he also negotiated an Asian trade deal. There was one other that I can't forget, but how many trade deals have the Biden-Harris administration negotiated in three and a half years? Zero, they've done nothing. It's a do nothing 
administration. How many peace agreements have they negotiated around the world? The Trump administration negotiated peace agreements in the Middle East of all places between Arab nations and Israel. He also negotiated peace in the um, in the uh, Eastern Europe, uh, rejuvenating peace agreements with Estonia and some of the Soviet bloc nations there in the Baltics. Biden administration's done nothing. In fact, during the three and a half years of the Biden administration, we've had war pop up while the Trump administration was negotiating peace agreements and free trade agreements. So please don't start threatening me and being concerned about the threat of or use of tariffs if Trump becomes president, because he's the only guy in the equation right now who's actually successfully negotiated free trade, no tariff agreements in major areas and, and economic areas across the country, or across the world. Excuse me. All right. Back to Lutnick here, because this is, and I really want you to hyper-focus on this. Can I just pause for a moment? How many news shows are you going to watch tonight in prime time on boring cable news or equally boring, appealing to 75-year-old and plus network news? How many of them are going to take 17 minutes to drill down on economic policies, free trade, and tariffs in this presidential election? This is why I love you guys so much for keeping our news program going, our political analysis show going. Because I know there's a hunger for this kind of content. I know there's a hunger for understanding the issues that are in this election and how it affects all of our lives. And I know that cable news and broadcast news completely ignore you, ignore the issues. They just want to talk about all the idiocy that the corporate legacy media wants to talk about that isn't relevant to you. But look at this. We're we're 17 minutes into this show and we're drilling down in a major serious way on economic policies and tariffs and you get and the audience is growing as we speak. Good job. Thank you. Thank you for keeping this going. All right. Back to this. So important when he starts talking about the Marshall Plan after World War II. Pay attention. He's going to negotiate with us and we will be more fair. In 1948, Right. We came up with something called the Marshall Plan. Right. The, the world, uh, Germany and, and, and Japan were destroyed after World War Two. And we wanted to export our economy to them. So we made a rule. They could tariff us and we won't tariff them so they can this rebuild. That's the best explanation I've heard. Of so they can rebuild yeah. their economy. We rebuilt their economy using something called the Marshall Plan. Yeah. Our economy is so awesome that we'll use it to help you rebuild. When should that have ended? What do you think? 1980? Right. 1985. I mean, why 40 years are Japan and Germany and all of Europe still tariffing the heck out of our auto industry, tariffing the heck out of our furniture industry? Do you realize all your furniture you're buying that's made foreign? It, it seems crazy. Why? It's because they tariff us and we don't tariff them. It's so it's fantastic. It is so obvious. And I didn't mean to cut him off in mid word there, but uh, it's it's impassioned and so smart. And you actually heard the panelists who were very skeptical. This is CNBC. They're very skeptical of this kind of thing. They're very old school Wall Street, free, again, free market things. And they all said, well, that's a perfect that's a perfect explanation. I've never I, that's so smart. It's, it makes so much sense. It's like, how did we get here exactly? Because after World War Two, after the generosity of our hearts and our nation, we wanted to rebuild Europe after they were torn into war. So we said, I'll tell you what, you, you tariff, tariff our goods. We won't charge any tariffs to you. We're going to help you build. Is it time now, 75 years later? Can we, can, we, can we sort of rethink that now? Especially now that it's not even individual countries we're dealing with now. Now it's the EU. The whole reason for the EU, EU and their monetary policies over there with the euro is that they want to compete with us. They are competing with us. So let's compete equally, shall we? Let's compete fairly. It's amazing. The second the tariffs become a reality, it's going to change behaviors here. I, you want proof of that? When taxes are raised on certain sectors, on cigarettes, why do they always raise taxes on cigarettes? Because they want to change your behavior. They don't want you to smoke, right? That's why they call them sin taxes. Now, sure, some people will continue to smoke, but some people think twice about it. When things get too expensive because taxes have been levied on it, you stop utilizing those things. When you find out, let me put it this way. If you found out that all the income you make for working on a Monday will be tax-free, but you will be taxed at 75% for all the other days of the week, do you think more people will want to work on Monday and make as much money as they can on Monday 
Like I'll work an 18 hour day on Monday, pay me for all the work I do on Monday and I'll take the rest of the week off. If you know that your Monday income is tax free and the rest of the week you're paying 75% of taxes, right? That's exactly what we would all do if we could. When you add taxes, when you add tariffs, people don't just say, well, they've added taxes and tariffs. I guess we're just going to continue doing what we always do regardless of the tariffs. No, it modifies behavior. It modifies the way we as individuals operate when we know we have to pay extraordinary taxes. Or on the other side, if we get a tax break, if we do this thing that they want us to do. And it modifies the way corporations behave as well. It's obvious, isn't it? Oh, one other thing from Trump. Uh, he always has these great moments that he just throws in there when he's uh, working on the fly. And he was in his element at this forum for Bloomberg. Uh, I just wanted you to watch this little thing. He starts riffing on Gavin Newsom in California, and it's gold. How about this? Gavin Newsom, he's the governor of California. Newsom. He signed Newsom, I call him. Yeah. <laughs> But do you, oh, do you I, think no, he, corrected, he corrected me? Said, there are, there are That's C the first time I've there, been there are CEOs out here. If they were said those sort of things about a rival CEO, they would be, they'd know. be sacked. Do you think I it's know, fine they don't for have a to president? survive like me? They don't have to go through the, what I have to go through. I, there has never been a president that's been treated like me, so I have to fight my own way. Well, you made a you made a you yeah, made a very good you made a very good job of he signed a bill in California two days ago that you don't even have the right to ask a person for voter ID. And if you ask a person for voter ID, of course you have to show voter ID. The only reason you wouldn't do it because they want to cheat. The bill says you cannot, it's against the law for you to ask a person, may I please see your voter ID when he votes? What is our country coming to? Uh, it's, uh, I don't know. I just like the whole idea of new scum. I I've always called him governor hair gel. It, it's a little different. It's vivid. And it certainly draws a, a picture for you, but new scum is elegant. He's good at that. Isn't he? I kind of like that, that whole idea. Oh, if, if uh, one of the CEOs here had uh, said that about one of their rival CEOs, they'd be sacked. What about you? He said, well, you know what? That's the beauty when you're president of not working for anyone except the people and the voters. Ridiculous. Listen, guys, I'll say it again. If the economy is, and it is, the number one issue facing voters here less than three weeks away from election day, I hope you're all paying attention. And your hopes. I hope you see exactly what's going on here between the dynamic new ideas from someone who's worked in the business world his entire life versus a woman who just has catchphrases and bullet points saying an opportunity economy. And if you ask her what that means, she'll search in her notes to give you some other bullet point that she's memorized. A woman who has only earned a government paycheck her entire adult life. By the way, there's one other person in American politics who has the same kind of track record, who has never actually run a company or even had a job, a real job, for the last 50 years of his adult life. He's only drawn a government paycheck. That would be Joe Biden. And look how he handled our economy.